Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is James Harding. Um, you'll have seen that my co-founder, Katie Vanek-Smith, has hailed the work of uh, Sam Hockley, Sam H, for the musical tunes to introduce a discussion on Churchill's legacy and place in the UK. Um, uh, I remember my very first concert I went to where the uh, opening act was better uh, than the main stage band and uh, so I hope that we'll live up to the musical introduction but we've got reason to hope that we will because we're joined tonight by um, uh, Richard Toy who is uh, one of the the most important historians hello Richard uh, um, in the country on Churchill um, the one who's willing to challenge some of our and I say uh, our, and I'll explain it in a minute, uh, you know, deeply held uh, views and I suppose hopes about uh, Churchill and his, uh, his place in the country. Uh, and we're joined too by Chris Bryant, uh, the MP. Um, Chris, really nice to see you. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. Um, I'm just going to, I'm going to actually tee this up before um, coming to you both, just for sort of some opening thoughts with this. Um, we um seek to bring in a number of different people and when we set up tortoise the argument for it was we needed a forum for civilized disagreements and we needed to put uh we need to open ourselves up to some of these conversations that we find really difficult and clearly what's happened in the months since the killing of george floyd has had I think one of the most unexpected reverberations in this country, which is not so much an interrogation of power structures, or not only an interrogation of power structures today, but an interrogation of our culture and our history. Tonight, one of the things that was really interesting is that in asking many people to come and make the argument for Churchill, one of the responses that we had, I think best sums up uh, the response that many people feel. And it was this, no, we shouldn't be ashamed of Winston Churchill. You should be ashamed of hosting a conversation like this. People take this extremely personally. So I open tonight by saying, look, we really want to hear everyone's points of view. The point of a thinking is to share different points of view, different experiences of history, whether it's you know, personal or intellectual, please do weigh in. Um, but we published today a piece by Richard Toy, which, I suppose, sets out, Richard, a pretty clear explanation of the critique of Churchill, particularly around race and empire. And I wonder whether you might start by just laying that out for people who haven't had a chance to read it, and, and if you like, as a kickstart of the conversation we're going to have. Yeah, you've, you've frozen. Um, i frozen, or you Not have. sure if people... Uh, okay, so I've, I just, sorry, you froze for a second there. Um, I will uh, start again to, 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 to respond to your question. So yes, um, I think that we, you, you raise a really important point, um, and in the, in the title of the talk, you highlight uh, the word ashamed, and I think that sort of, you know, ideas of pride and shame are very much sort of wrapped up with what we're going to be talking about this evening, so that um, uh, you know, one can draw attention to uh, you know, sort of uncontested historical facts about the things which Churchill said and did, and it would be possible for me to sort of, you know, give a long list of um, you know, racist statements which Churchill made during his life. He said, for example, he didn't think that you know, black people were as capable as white people. He said that he hated people with slit eyes and pig tails. He said that the Indians were a, a beastly people with a beastly religion and so on and so forth. Now, um, by simply drawing attention to uh, these statements, a lot of people will react uh, by uh, in, in a very emotional way and conclude that you're saying things which you haven't necessarily, which you don't necessarily mean and you certainly haven't said. Um, and so people will move from uh, you know, the statement that Churchill said things that were you know, clearly racist. I mean, I'm very, very open to discussion, but you know, any of the things which I've just quoted, I, you know, um, if anybody wants to say they're not racist, well, fine, we can have a discussion about it. But if, if these 
things aren't racist, I don't really know what are. Um, and so people move from uh, the fact that you've made a, a sort of an observation, a historical observation about Churchill to um, the, the idea that uh, you were in, in trying to denigrate his entire character and destroy his reputation by drawing attention to these things. And that by extension, you're not, not only trying to denigrate him, but you're trying to denigrate the whole of the British nation, both in the past and in fact in the present, so that people take it personally. So you say something about Churchill, and a lot of people actually interpret you, uh, interpret that as you telling that they telling them that they personally are racist, which of course, it's a big leap to get from one thing to the other, but uh, these are in fact the, the kind of emotional reactions that people have uh, and, and which one has to be aware of when you sort of walk into this minefield. So Richard, I think, that, I think that's really helpful and, and I think we're gonna to want to have a discussion about two big themes here, I suppose. One is Britain's understanding of empire and colonialism and how that does weave into our understanding of our place in the world today but also I suppose the critique that people would put to you of judging yesterday's men and women by today's value standards and politics and I, I imagine we'll get into that. I, I'm going to just invite Chris Bryant. Um, Chris Bryant I, I was really glad to see that you were joining us. I didn't know that this was a bugbear of yours so, so tell me w w what's your point of view on Churchill? Well, you've got to bear in mind that I'm the MP for the Ronda. Yes. And um, Winston Churchill was the Liberal Home Secretary, according to um, a sort of slightly mythologized version of events, who sent the troops in to quell the Tonopandi riots. Um, in actual fact, he, he, he responded to a request that, that troops should be allowed to come to South Wales um, and, and, if necessary, could then be deployed um, in Tonopandi. So it's not quite as it's been written up, but it's certainly true that um, uh, that one of the very few constituencies that Churchill never visited after the Second World War was the Rhonda because um, the people of the Rhonda didn't want to see him. Um, and that all goes back to the Tonopandi riots. Um, and, and, and Chris, just how much is that the case still today? Um, yeah, I mean, every child that goes to school in the Ronda knows that Winston Churchill, or the, what the version they, they know is that Winston Churchill sent the troops in to Tonopandi. And so it's a very strong local feeling. Um, I'm for, I run a, an arts festival here, or I would if we were able to have arts festivals, and we were going to have Nicholas Soames to come along and defend his um, grandfather at a um, at an event this summer but unfortunately that's not been possible to do so we're, we're still hoping to do that next year and get some of the students um, at the local uh, at one of the local schools to, to kind of quiz them on it but I, oddly I've also just been I've just finished a book which is coming out in a few weeks time um, called The Glamour Boys which is um, I won't bore you with but um, but Churchill features in it quite a bit because it's about a group of um, gay Tory MPs who in the 1930s and um, at the beginning of the 1930s went to Germany a lot basically to have sex because it wasn't illegal in Weimar Republic Germany um, and um, and then they knew lots of early gay Nazis um, the gay Nazis were all bumped off in the light of the long knives by Hitler and they come back these these men in the UK become the first actually before Churchill the first to warn about Hitler um, because they know people who are being uh, both Jews and gay friends who are being arrested in Germany and sent to concentration camps. And, um, and interestingly, they, th this group of men, none of whose names you will ever have heard of, um, hung out with Churchill and Anthony Eden all the time. And it was Neville Chamberlain that then called this group the Glamour Boys as a way of insinuating something about their sexuality. But what's interesting is that um, Churchill never seems to have worried about that. I mean, most of the time, in most of those meetings, uh, roughly half the men in the room were queer mm. in some shape. I, I use the word in the non-pejorative sense. Mm. Um, and indeed, one of them, when Jack McNamara um, was killed in action in, in uh, 1945, um, Churchill wrote to uh, Jack's mother, Natalie Orpen, saying he was all that a man should be. Right. So, um, 
I, I, um, I do sometimes worry about the anachronistic judging of Churchill by today's standards. Mm. Um, but oddly, I kind of want to say, well, I think on, on that one issue, mm. he was probably um, okay. You know, on <laughs> India, on race, he was not great. Well, can I, Chris, it's, it's funny because as you were talking, I was reminded of an experience I had, and I haven't thought of it for probably 20 years. I was taken on a walk, must be 20 years ago now, by Martin Gilbert, the historian, you know, mm. voluminous historian of Churchill. And it was really a walk around London. He took us to the top of Primrose Hill and told the story about Churchill and his relationship with the lion at London Zoo and the speech he gave after the Blitz and having seen London and still being there. And then we walked all the way down from there, all the way to St. James's Park. And when we got to St. James's Park, he told a story about an, an awkward moment, and I don't know exactly where in Churchill's career this was, but two guardsmen had been found or been discovered in St. James's Park having sex in the middle of November, right? And this was brought to Churchill. What did he want to do about it? And at least the story as it was recounted to me, Richard, you'll know better than I will whether it's true, was that Churchill's response when this was presented to him, the news of these two men, um, um, in the middle of the night, three in the morning in St. James's Park was, good God, the fortitude of the great British guardsmen. And he, and he was completely... It was the winter, I think, as well, was the idea. Well, November, yes, I think it was. So, so th there's something... One of the reasons why I think people apply a, a love and admiration to Churchill is not just for, quote-unquote, winning the war, but for this spirit and tone, which I mean, means that some of the conversation we're about to have is relevant. But before I come back to, to either of you, I'm just going to ask my colleague Zav uh, Greenwood. We, we prepared some slides just to try and give some context to why we're having this conversation, why Churchill feels so much more relevant and live now. Uh, Zav, do you want to just talk through them? Because I think they're helpful to give some context to this conversation. Yeah, of course. Uh, so I'm a little too young to remember this. I remember watching the television programme, <laughs> but I remember the controversy surrounding it. But we're going to start in 2002 when there was this... Um, BBC poll to, to vote for the Great Britain. Uh, and it was something that Churchill ended up winning. But I think people who can remember that, they can remember the kind of fierce debates that was going on throughout. Um, there were accusations of vote rigging. There was, um, you know, controversy that there were no black nominees. And in fact, there was a Greatest Black Britain poll that was done the, done the next year. But ultimately, in a poll of, you know, 1.2 million people voting, Churchill just about came on top. Um, and then if we move to the next slide, uh, I, I think we want to kind of back up to the last few years. And uh, this is a kind of Google Trends chart. So the number 100 marks the kind of maximum interest in the search term Churchill on Google. And you can actually see in the last few years, there have been big events. There have been the 50th, 50th anniversary of his death. There's been The Darkest Hour, the film which Gary Oldman won Best Actor for. But really the biggest interest in Churchill, the most searches by far have really come in the past few months. And it was that moment where um, the Churchill statue was sprayed with graffiti and it was boarded up. And so, you know, I think we can, we can definitely all discuss whether or not uh, the statue should come down or, or what the morality was of that action, but it really got people talking uh, quite a lot more than anything else in the past few years. Um, and then if we just go to the next slide. Um, so I think this is really interesting because uh, I think as Izzy Nicholson alluded to in the chat, discussion of Churchill is really quite a nuanced often. There's, it's very much framed at the extreme, so people venerate him or people really, really do think he's a villain. Um, but if you actually look at this, uh, this kind of YouGov poll from last year, I think two, two things which are interesting. The first is that in every single age group, there are people, you know, nearly a third of people in nearly every age group who think that he was a hero and a villain. They see that there are two sides of, the, of him and they can accommodate both sides of him. Um, and I think the second thing that is interesting is among young people, um, up to the age of 49, 
uh, you know, they're normally characterized as the people who really, really dislike Churchill. And uh, even for them, you can see a quarter of them just don't know what they think. So I think, I think we really are still, you know, in this discussion about his legacy and lots of people don't know what they think. And if they have decided, they do have kind of more nuanced points of view than we would allow. Um, and then can we get to the next one, please? Um, this is a slightly more fun one. So this is, this is kind of well-known depictions of Churchill in the past 80 years or so. And you can see that there is this kind of visual obsession with Churchill, which, which really ca carries through and is almost kind of increasing in recent years. So we've got the King's Speech, uh, we've got Inglourious Basses, we've got Dark Sour. Aside from the films, we have The Crown, we have Peaky Blinders. And if you think of the actors who played Churchill, these are really kind of quite revered actors. We can think of Brian Cox, Timothy Spall, Richard Burton, Albert Finney, Christian Slater, Gary Oldman. Um, and I think- Robert everyone, Hardy. I'm Robert Hardy. <laughs> I knew I'd forget someone important. Um, but, you, but you can see that there is this kind of visual obsession with Churchill as well. And of course, we, all, we can all kind of picture what he looks like. Um, and then the final side, this is, this is just to kind of, kind of frame the debate if it needs framing anymore. We've already mentioned a couple of these things, but, but things that do come up in his legacy, obviously the, the victory of, over Nazi Germany, the, you know, the speeches, the we will fight them on the beaches, which I think nearly everyone kind of knows that speech, at least to some degree. Um, but then there are these things, these questions, uh, his views on race and imperialism. So not only his comments, but his uh, his comments on race, but his comments on Gandhi and uh, India, as Chris has mentioned, the Tony Pandy riots. And finally, the Bengal famine, which is something which I think is being discussed increasingly. Um, I think there were a million Indians who, were, uh, who died and there's questions of neglect from Churchill's policies. It's something which has been discussed, but I think we still, personally, I haven't got to the bottom of, of to what extent Churchill was responsible, responsible to that. So I hope that kind of frames the debate a bit. That's okay. No, thank you. That's, uh, thank you, Zav. C Richard, can I ask you just to pick up on the point, if you like, raised by, and you could say almost factually raised, by the spike in Google searches around Churchill following the increase in Black Lives Matter protests. Isn't that actually evidence of what Churchill's defenders say is going on here, which is people are responding to the politics of the day and taking it out on Churchill um, because these, the, these cultural arguments are in some ways easier than the really fundamental economic, social, or legal ones. Well, I, I think we'd need to know in a little bit more detail what the people uh, are actually googling for and what their motivation is that one can google for things for all sorts of reasons um and uh, you know that so i wouldn't i wouldn't sort of jump to that conclusion um i mean of course it's it's you know remember that um the the, the churchill defenders are themselves contributing to um you know news sources and uh, you know, social media stuff about Churchill as well. So um, people may well be, um, you know, sort of looking for their content and finding you know, their content too. Mm. So I think that um, there but, is... But, but, just, but just, sorry to interrupt, Richard, but, but I think Zav makes the point. There's Googling, is Churchill racist? And, and I suppose I'd love to hear from you as a historian, how do you answer the criticism that says what's happening here is we're revising Churchill to suit today's political arguments rather than making a measured judgment of the man in his times? Well, I think that um, the, the, if, on the surface, that's a plausible sounding argument. But, and of course, it, I, I believe as much as anybody uh, that it is important to uh, put Churchill in the context of his times. But I think that the way in which uh, context is invoked, the way in which people say Churchill was a man of his times is actually very often um, as a simplistic way of, um, you know, sort of a get out of jail free card, if you like which doesn't actually pay attention to what the genuine context was. So um, to sort of draw attention to the fact uh, that 
uh, Churchill was quite heavily criticized within his own lifetime, including by other conservative imperialists of a, of sometimes of a very similar background to him, people like Leo Amory, who was his Secretary of State for India. And uh, you know, sort of much of the evidence for uh, you know, sort of the criticisms of Churchill over the Bengal famine, for example, come from Amory's diary when he was sort of desperately trying to get Churchill to do something. Uh, and Churchill was, um, you know, being very dismissive, uh, you know, to say the least, and you know, sort of making quite callous remarks. So, um, so in fact, uh, sort of this idea that everybody who was uh, sort of born a Victorian and grew up in the Victorian age was going to have views which were the same as Churchill's mm -hmm. and that nobody would have thought to have criticised them at the time is simply wrong. Um, but I, I mean, of, of course, what, you know, what I do think is that in any instance of anything that Churchill or anybody else said, uh, one needs to you know, look at the context in a, in a very detailed way, in a very precise way, and you know sometimes that can um, you know help absolve Churchill, if you will. Other times, uh, it, it really doesn't. And, and 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 just on the can I just pick up on the Bengal famine, in particular one one of the questions that I suppose arise around the Bengal famine, and it is this: is the extent to which the problem here is that we can't see the woods for the trees that because we don't fully understand empire and the UK's history around the world Churchill himself becomes the lightning conductor and we argue about Churchill without really understanding that you know he was a person responding to whether it was Leo Amory or whether it was the government of India there was just a different world view as regards Britain and India in fact Britain and the world well, I mean, I think it's true that he serves as a lightning conductor. I mean, I think that's quite a good way of putting it. And I think that one could equally say that he attracts criticism uh, of a kind which you know, many of his contemporaries don't, partly because they've simply been forgotten about, so that one could, or at least, you know, some of them forgotten about in the UK. So, um, uh, Jan Christian Smuts, for example, the South African Prime Minister, who also has a, uh, has a statue close to where Churchill's is in Parliament Square. Um, you know, he was unquestionably a racist. He, he was actually the, sort of the last pre-apartheid prime minister. So he, he wasn't the absolutely sort of worst of the worst. And, you know, one could even say that he had certain good qualities. But um, nevertheless, uh, I, although I, I think that I spotted a news story when the, when the Churchill statue was defaced, suggested that Smuts's had been uh, as well. When I went to look back for it, um, I couldn't find the story and it certainly didn't become a, a big controversy and I'm sure people weren't sort of Googling for Smuts. Now, you know, if, if one is, one could well say um, that, uh, you know, if, if criticisms are going to be made of Churchill, then certainly they should be um, made of other people of that period as well. And that might well go for, you know, a number of figures of the, you know, the Attlee government, for example, as well. Um, and so I think that um, you know, Churchill has simply become symbolic of a wide range of values which people want to argue over. Well, th thank you. I'm, I'm going to come back to Chris in a moment, but I'm just going to bring in Emma Ferguson, if I might, J just before I go back to you, Chris, because, you know, part of the nature of thinking is to try and hear as many people as possible. And one of the things I really love about it is finding out things that I didn't really know at all. And even in the chat, as, um, as you were speaking, Chris, Emma was talking about the way in which she had learned her history and her Churchill history. Hello, Emma. Could you tell us a little bit about how you see it? Um, so I think, first of all, it's important to say that the Northern Irish education system doesn't necessarily focus on the same things that the system does in England. So we had a much larger focus on Irish history and Northern Irish history in particular. So anything we learned about, if they could insert something on Northern Ireland, they would. Um, and so when we were learning about World War II, we had all of the kind of Churchill was a great leader, Churchill did this, did that. Um, but we were also kind of taught about some of his attitudes towards Northern Ireland. He was, he was pro-United Ireland, which is a totally fair opinion to have. But some of the ways he expressed that uh, were kind of presented to us as maybe a way to view him in a less favourable light. You know, we kind of were taught that he sometimes approached Northern Ireland as a bargaining chip in World War II, 
to kind of oppose Ireland's neutrality. Um, and we were taught about uh, Chamberlain's use of the treaty port, um, giving, returning the treaty ports and how Churchill had not been keen on that. And so I suppose when I hear about the debate about how Churchill is presented, you know, absolutely the Black Lives Matter protests and stuff are extremely important in terms of viewing his, looking at his ideas on race. But I think when I was growing up, we were fairly, we, we weren't as encouraged to view him as this completely positive leader. We were aware of his kind of shortcomings, um, especially in regard to the country that we came from. Mm. Emma, thank you. Chris, can I ask you, I was really, I was really struck by actually how carefully you framed things at the beginning. Right? I, he didn't just send in the troops, right? that he was responding to a request. Having considered it, what's your, what are you really saying about Churchill? That Not that, that we should be ashamed of him, but that we should understand in more detail the context he was working in, or we should have a more nuanced attitude to our heroes. How, how would you see this? I, I studied theology and um, trying to understand Jesus within the context of his own time was one of the most difficult things of all. Um, and the hermeneutical circle that you kind of get involved in of trying to assess your reaction to the culture in which you live and then the person that you're writing about in, within the culture in which they live, I think is quite difficult. I, I think, um, you know, just as prime minister, um, or as a minister, as a, as a politician, I think his, he, he has a mixed record, is the truth. I mean, everybody says, you know, he was the first person to campaign for rearmament, which was necessary to see off Hitler. But actually, it was his decisions as Chancellor of the Exchequer between 1926 and 1929 that gave us the rearmament problem 10 years later, um, because he set this um, decision that, uh, we, we, we had to have this foresight of 10 years of not needing arms. And as long as we maintained that, we wouldn't start rearming. Um, in, in the Second World War, you know, in 1942, he very nearly lost the premiership himself to, to Stafford Cripps, for heaven's sake. Um, he lost the general election, I think, because he didn't understand the home front at all. Um, and in a curious way, the, one of the reasons that he's become a national hero is not just, not just because of the war, but because he managed to bring, um, you know, the trade union movement in under his wing during the Second World War. Um, but he didn't manage to do that again in his second time round as prime minister. The one thing I, I, I think you cannot accuse him of is of um, anti-Semitism in the way that it was utterly pervasive in British politics in the 1930s um, through from Nancy Astor I mean even decent people like Harold Nicholson you know often resorted to profound anti-Semitism and that's even leaving aside the Oswald Mosleys and the um, Archibald Ramseys and people like that um, so he, he was able in some instances to transcend his own time uh, but there are other ways in which he's deeply embedded in it. And, you know, we've discussed some of those already. And Chris, can I just ask you, as a, as a politician, one of, the, one of the arguments that you hear is that even debates like this um, have, a, have a risk, which is that they, they so infuriate people. They, 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 they feel like cultural vandalism. They feel as though you're taking away... The, the few heroes we have, particularly at a time when people are looking for leadership, and that what you get as a result of it is, is not a country that is, you know, more thoughtful about its history, but a country that is actually angrier and more reactionary and more dismissive of a conversation around Churchill's legacy as a sort of bunch of woke metropolitan liberals having a, a pop at one of the country's few great heroes. And if anything, it stokes a reactionary uh, approach and uh, sort of sentiment in, in, in public life and in politics. W what do you think of that? I, I think that's right. You know, Britain is very, very divided. Um, so is the United States of America, obviously. But I mean, we are a very divided and incidentally that hasn't Trump got a, a bust of um, Churchill in his um, Oval Office, mm -hmm. um, which sort of depresses me. 
Um, but, it, but in a way, it says, um, it makes exactly the point you just made, James, which is that th this is, people are declaring their own identity. They're, they're saying more about themselves often in what they state about Churchill than they are actually saying anything about Churchill. Um, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? In, the, in that, old, in that um, uh, national poll, Princess Diana came third. Now, I, I'm, I'm a sort of non-combatant Republican, but I'm 100% behind um, uh, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. I haven't the faintest idea really why, other than that, every, that the people I dislike um, seem to dislike them. So oh. I'm on their side. So it's about your own identity rather than about a, a critical analysis of the history, isn't it? That's uh, so interesting. I'm, I'm going to invite my colleague, uh, fellow editor at Tours, Matt Dancona, to come in on this because Matt, um, I know that for a fair bit of the summer you were thinking, in fact, I hope, writing a book about identity in the UK and, and I suspect what Chris <laughs> is saying um, rings some bells for you. What, what, what do you make of this? Uh, thanks, James. Well, I, I think, as you know, I, 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 I sort of regard history as a discipline rather than a comfort food. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a fan of intellectual discomfort. And so I like... <laughs> I like the idea, I think it's debates like tonight are excellent. Um, and I think that history has to be warts and all um, and new perspectives. So one of them, actually my favorite history book of the last three, uh, few years is Halle Rubenhold's book, The Five on the, the victims of Jack the mm. Ripper, which really had a transformative uh, effect upon me about the whole story. So uh, look, any sensible person can see that Churchill has a rap sheet and it's right that we uh, look at it in greater detail than we have and, and we acknowledge in full and in detail those aspects of his identity as much as his role in defeating Hitler. Um, and and there's a, there, is a, there is a potential uh, broader good that comes out of that is that that may well be a gateway into um, a much needed reassessment of Britain's imperial and colonial past um, in an objective and comprehensive way. Where I think it gets absurd is in two separate things, which we've partly touched upon. The first is the idea that you you shouldn't point these things out about Churchill, that it's, a, it's a somehow an impertinence, uh, an act of vandalism to discuss, uh, you know, a, 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 a member of the national pantheon in, in these terms. And I think that's ridiculous. But at the other extreme, the second is that, um, as a consequence, we should sort of um, not just uh, reassess Churchill and keep him under review, but almost eradicate him from the nation's history and, you know, that um, in, this, in this new debate, we, we do lose sight occasionally of the fact that he did play a very important part in defeating the greatest evil the world has ever seen and a power that sought to bring about the industrialized extinction of an entire people. And the question I always throw back at people who object to Churchill so strongly is, uh, okay, who would you actually like to have been prime minister then? You know, not, not, not talking about it from 2020, but, you know, would you have liked Halifax? Would you have liked Chamberlain to have remained prime minister? Who? Who would have been the acceptable option? You know, Jeremy Corbyn wasn't born until 1949, so he wasn't available. <laughs> but, you know, who, 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 who is it that you want? And I, I think that the, the risk in all of this is that, that history becomes actually a sort of form of interior decor for the present. And that the problem is that we lose perspective and we lose a sense of the sheer scale of what was at stake in the Second World War. Um, you know, it, that, that, that it, it, you get to this point where people say, oh, all, all we were taught at school was that Churchill was good and Hitler was bad. Yeah, you know, it, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a comparison between the two, that's right. Now, you, we need to be taught a lot more about Churchill, but, but it, is, it is desperately worrying 
that we lose sight of that importance. And I do think, and the slide about films, I think was very interesting because I think the, the kind of, um, the gravitational pull of Churchill, Second World War, Dunkirk and all that is part of a, a kind of national mulching and reassessment about what to do about the Second World War, whether to sort of consign it to the past, uh, which I think would be a terrible shame. And I, th I think the risk is that what you end up with is not only losing perspective, but a sort of replacement of, of, of history with a kind of performative yearning um, to kind of de defenestrate past figures um, instead of actually, and this is the really key point, of, of doing the hard practical stuff that makes a difference and builds a better future. And that, that, that's my concern. Matt, thank you. It was, it was really helpful. I, I, want, I want to, I don't know whether Violet is there, I don't know Violet, whether you can join us, because I was really interested by the, as you were talking about, Violet made a comment about having tried to introduce some questions about Churchill and racism in the war rooms in London. Violet, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. So, so I'm fascinated by that. Can you just, um, we're talking about history as interior decor, and you're in a different sense talking about genuinely a piece of interior decor, how you decorate it and how you approach the, the war rooms. Just tell us a little bit about the history of making that happen. I thought it was very interesting because, um, because this obviously this came from the war rooms. I'm a writer for music. I create interactives and videos for museums. That's my job. Mm. And it came from the war rooms that they actually wanted to kind of highlight this. And this was a while back. So I'd worked for them for their 2014, um, their first world war galleries. And then immediately after they did their first, they did their first world war galleries at the Imperial War Museum. Uh, they did, they were sort of doing some revamping at the war, the Churchill War Rooms, and it, you know it came from them. And I think I do think that you know perhaps people who don't visit these museums might sort of think that they'd be you know from a curatorial perspective be kind of bigging up Churchill, but like absolutely none of it. And they obviously um, the curator there was very clear that this was an open question, and as part of the interactive, which was like you know kind of probing the true character of Churchill and trying to show the kind of shades of grey and the different perspectives. One of the questions in this interactive that I wrote was, was Churchill racist? Mm. And um, the, uh, the interactive gave the visitors, you know, some pros and some cons, and it did not try in any way, shape or form to say that there was a right or a wrong answer. And, you know, obviously at the end you get a vote. What, what do you think? Do you think he was a racist? And I, to give you an idea, some of the points they brought up, um were um i i guess um that they that um his at uh, churchill's attitude to gandhi i think they said so um uh you know and 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 the sort of the his his idea that you know he didn't want india to have sort of self governance and so forth um so that was obviously sort of went against him but the the curator was of of the museum when i interviewed him was very keen to point out that um you know, although, say, Churchill had called Gandhi a half-naked fakir, mm -hmm. um, but that, that, that Churchill also had quite a mischievous black, you know, sense of humour and, and wasn't necessarily, you know, it, it, was, it was kind of like a, you know, a, just like a, a bad joke, not necessarily that he actually had that attitude. So that he, he believed that a lot of the things that Churchill said um, were... W w w could have been taken in kind of a more extreme way than that than was meant um although and although you know um i think that uh he also uh, uh, what also came out of the the research when we did that was that um although you know a lot of people just say oh churchill's a man of his time that, that you know, there's no real there were plenty of i, I think it's already been covered here in this discussion, but there are plenty of you know examples of anti-racist campaigns and so on and so so forth at the time. So pe people were not you know completely you know sort of blind ignorant about what was what was uh, what what was right and what was wrong. Um, I, I, think, I mean, Viola, I just want to say I think it's, I think one of the things that you're kind of pushing us towards is also stopping to think about. Uh, and hello, good evening to your cat too. <laughs> welcome, welcome your cat to the conversation. Is that is that there's a, there's a difference between arguments over history and arguments in the pub, 
and there's a difference between you know what we learn in schools and universities and what we see in biopics and i suppose part of it is caricature as history um which is you know is worth thinking about i, I just want to come back if i could and Vav, thank you i just want to come back to richard toy if i might for a minute R richard can i ask you a little bit about your what you see as your responsibility in this in do you feel as though you're actively trying to do something that is political or are, do you feel as though what you're trying to do is something that is if you like strictly within the bounds of uh the pursuit of you know historical understanding well i mean that's a very good question i suppose i would say that I'd like to keep it within strictly the bounds of historical understanding, but you've sort of got to recognize that things which you say or write, you know, will be interpreted in a political context, um, which I suppose is really sort of the start, the, the point which I started with. So I think what I'm really trying to do, um, you know, I'm not going around saying, I think people should be ashamed of church law, should be ashamed of being British, but I suppose it is the case that there are certain narratives which I find you know, sort, of, uh, sort of complacent or nationalistic uh, or failing to take certain things into account, um, which do need to be uh, you know, corrected and, and draw attention to. Um, and I suppose, you know, it's I, I, the experience of being a historian is sometimes a bit odd in that you know, most of my time I spent, you know, I spend writing, you know, aside from teaching, of course, you know, sort of writing books, which are sort of 160,000 words long, and, you know, hopefully a very nuanced and very detailed and sort of going sort of there, everybody, you know, um, in sort of slightly passive, ag passive aggressive way, you know, you want to know what I, I, I think, you know, read, read this kind of 400 page book. Um, but of course, the the things which people are more likely to read and are more likely to have any kind of impact are when, um, well, you know, a site such as yourself, um, uh, you know, asks you to write a, an article of a few hundred words, or if you do a TV interview or something like that. And so, you know, after a, you know, the book, uh, you know, my book Churchill's Empire, which kind of created. Um, you know, a certain amount of stir when it originally came out in 2010, you know, then a kind of a long period of silence. And then, you know, in the, in the Black Lives Matter context, then people were suddenly very eager to talk about it again. Right. Well, well Richard, I'm, I'm going to bring in a few other people who've got points of view who've commented. Um, I, I, want to, I, I want to come to Paula Candace because I think there's a... Paul, I'm not sure whether I've pronounced your name right, so forgive me if I haven't. But you making a point actually about uh, appetite for, for heroes. I was struck by your, by your comment in the chat because it feels to me as though a lot of the time we spend our time yearning for people who seem to have leadership qualities. And you're saying, no, we've got a sort of soft spot for people who are heroes and we don't, don't understand. I think William Jeremy made the same point, some of their more human aspects. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Great. Um, yeah, I guess the reason I made that comment is I, I just don't think that this is a Churchill-specific problem. Mm -hmm. So I think we the same problem holds for, we have similar discussions about many, many people. So I myself, uh, I'm, I'm a scientist. So we have a lot of the same discussions and debates about famous scientists that now turn out to not, you know, ha have been so great in their personal lives. So Richard Feynman is a good example of that. And people just seem to be unable to um, except that he could have been a good scientist, but a horrible person at mm -hmm. the same time. Mm -hmm. And they feel the need to either kind of whitewash the bad things that he did, um, enable to like to be able to hero worship him or to just completely also get rid of this, get rid of the good signs that he did because he was such a horrible person. Mm -hmm. And I think this is because we see people as good or bad people. And maybe instead we should, um, we should try to encourage people to think more of good actions and bad actions because again humans are complex and I think this is because already as children like children's stories they're you know the good guys and the bad guys and I think this just this is how we like to see everyone we're not really able to see the nuance that, that's that's that is really is really interesting I'm th th thank you very much Paula I'm into I, I just want to respond to um Vihan in the chat Vihan made the point that you know um 
the Bengal famine saw three million people in India die. You don't need to be a man of your times to see that that was that that, that was wrong, and that the failure of the British government to uh, at least diminish the impact of that famine and come to the assistance of people in Bengal is something that is not a a piece of activism. Is not a question of time. I, I think one of the things that's really interesting about the debate that we're having is I think a lot of people just weren't aware of the the views in India. Um, uh, the, the, the report in by the BBC, by my old colleague, you'll get to my, that, that brought this to much wider attention, I think was just bringing a subject that was just very, very narrowly known in the UK and now much more widely known. And I am struck, I'm gonna ask Luke Bederman to, to weigh in, because I am struck by Luke's point about the perceptions of Churchill, if you like, reinforcing um, well, I think what you said, what's owed to white Britishness. I think that's a really interesting subject. But can I just come to Izzy Nicholson first, and then I'm going to come to you, Luke. Izzy, the reason I want to come to you is that you've talked a lot about kind of what we've learned, what we've, what's our assumed and established knowledge. So, so what, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, um, basically, um, I, I've been teaching history for about 10 years now um, in high schools. And so obviously this is topics that come up year in, year out. And depending on the syllabus depends on what you end up teaching people. But I mean, for one example, I was teaching year eight. So they're about 12, 13, about Churchill. And we were looking at all of his history. We were looking back to the Boer War. We were doing a, an overview. And I think, Two hours after the end of the day, I got a phone call from a, pair, a set of parents and they said, why are you pushing a left wing agenda against Churchill on my child? Hmm. <laughs> and all I'd done was present a debate about who Churchill was and what he'd done. And, and this was the how, reaction. And Izzy, I'm really interested. How much do you think that what Chris was describing is right, that what that was about was the politics or sense of place of the parent that was calling? I think it was, I think there was a very much that, that there was an element of that that their kid had come home saying all of these different things and not necessarily everything was good and therefore why was this being something that was discussed? <laughs> Interesting okay Izzy that is really fac fascinating example but just out of interest where, 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 in, where in the country do you teach? Um, in the northeast. All right okay really <laughs> really interesting and do you just out of interest then if you are in the northeast do you buy the point that i was making to chris which was that one of the risks of a debate like this and i suppose you're kind of quote unquote opening up the debate is that actually you stoke that reactionary feeling the sense that british identity is being persecuted i think i think there can be that element and i think there can be that moment where people get very nervous and worried and think you're trying to challenge them Mm -hmm. <laughs> as opposed yeah. to challenge the the ideas that existed at the time. Right. Izzy, thank you. <laughs> Luke, but I'm, I'm going to invite him because I think that there's a natural follow-on from this, which is, you know, you've written here, Churchill is a vessel, vessel for some very modern and discriminatory ideas about what is quote-unquote owed to white Britishness. Can you explain what you mean? Um, yeah, I can try. It was off the back of speaking to quite a number of people who turned up uh, in mid-May, uh, mid-June, sorry, to protect Churchill's statue during the um, Black Lives Matter protests. And um, two big things came out of that. One was that I learned plenty of them were basically actually ignorant of the details of Churchill's uh, career um, and had a very sort of superficial or um, uh, simplified image of what he'd accomplished and, and, and what he was done. But the, the, the specific thing was that they saw Churchill's legacy. Um, it seemed almost like a debt that was owed to him as a hero of the British Empire and uh, undeniably white British institutions. And um, I, I couldn't help but thinking and listening to some of them say that uh, if, if Churchill was taken down, then they would tear down Mandela. Um, and it, it was just a really sort of trite and, but also quite scary e exposition of how people saw Churchill and the side that he was on um, and, and how they saw themselves in relation to the people on the other side of the line. And, and just briefly what I meant about being owed, 
I think plenty of the people in that crowd protecting Churchill um, felt like they had spent the last 10, 15 years being constantly stripped of status and economic access and all sorts of things. And, and Churchill remains this kind of shining beacon of what white Britishness could achieve, especially in sort of direct opposition to what Matt perhaps rightly said was the greatest evil humanity has ever seen. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I meant. And, and, and then Luke, in that spirit, don't you see that one of the risks of, if you like, picking a fight with Churchill is that you alienate, I don't mean you, but I mean the, uh, a, a, a protest movement, even a progressive movement, alienates its would-be allies by taking away from them people who actually do provide beacons of light, do stand up to fascists and do provide an example of what the courage of your convictions and leadership means. And yeah. That's, that's not, that's not going to help change, frankly, change the world. No, I, I, I think the big effect that it really had the, the, either the, the, the idea that people were in the Black Lives Matter movement were going after Churchill was to alienate a lot of people in the middle ground who are actually the people for whom we need a meeting of minds because yeah. that, that, that group um, are easily spun off by this idea that, that Churchill will be torn down. And I, I, I think it was a ridiculous notion. My, my, my dad, who is um, of Ghanaian descent, uh, my, uh, my granddad came over uh, from Ghana um, on independence, he's for a while said to me that Churchill should have a plaque that says national hero and racist. Um, the, the reason being that that's, that's what most people could reach the conclusion to, to see him as. But hang on a second, then, but then uh, just to pick up on um, uh, uh, the earlier point about Jan Smuts, which point about Jan Smuts, you'd have it about you'd have X and racist for every, every person on a plinth around the country, wouldn't you? Well, maybe, but I don't, perhaps that would send the message that Britain was being more honest and less exceptionist about the... the yeah. I, I'm gonna just, I'm, uh, Asad Qureshi, are you there, Asad? I just wanna bring you in because uh, you've said the thing I most like to hear. I disagree completely. The culture which produced Churchill is the culture which has led to black <coughs> people existing. Are you there, Asad? Hi, yeah, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear you well. Yeah, so what I mean by that is the kind of culture which allowed Churchill to become a dominant force in the um, political sphere and which allowed him to become a lionised in the first place is the same thing which has led us to need a Black Lives Matter movement in the first place um, because it's the same kind of approaching British history with these rose-tinted glasses the idea that fundamentally the empire was a force for good and not critically engaging with it at any point of the educational um, journey that people go on, which allows people to think things like touching on um, the concepts they just brought up around what's owed to, to um, Churchill. And if we don't actually engage with it in a way which says, oh, hang on, we can openly talk about um, how he was he had very like racist ideas um, there's a lot of dark sides to him but we just don't engage with it in that way at all so it lets people go about their lives thinking oh yeah this person was fine and that starts to accumulate over time and it eventually becomes a situation where you have people who think that you know, it, it, it feeds into the whole kind of British exceptionalism, which just isn't true. And if anything, it produces a lot of damaging effects. Right. I, I, think, I, I think that this is the difficult thing. I mean, I think you put your finger on this, on the, the fundamental issue here, which is how do you have a very complicated conversation about colonialism, empire, Britain's place in the world as a consequence of that, mm -hmm. without having a vehicle for it. And it might be the vehicle for it clumsily is Winston Churchill. I think that's a difficulty here. I, I'm going to come back to try and see if, if, um, uh, if Chris and, and Richard can, uh, can help us with this. I might, I might also just invite Nemo Omer, who's just joined us. I'd be interested to know what Nemo thinks. Um, Richard, why, why don't you start? Tell us sensibly how, in the next 10 years, we should 
in our schools, in our sort of public places, if you like, kind of re recalibrate our, the country's relationship with, with Winston Churchill? Well, it's a big question. Um, I think that you can see that some key organizations such as the National Trust and Churchill College, for example, are genuinely trying to do this to promote the difficult conversations that you were talking about earlier. Uh, this morning, I talked to a group of, of volunteers at the National Trust uh, you know, to sort of help um, make them better prepared uh, to deal with uh, visitors to Chartwell, at Churchill's house in Kent, uh, you know, where they may, you know, be getting both sides of the argument and sort of how can they best be, um, you know, sort of factually informed and prepared for, you know, the different uh, kinds of arguments that they may encounter. Similarly, I'm going to be involved in an event, one of a series which Churchill College uh, is organising, um, which is, again, to, you know, similar to what we're doing tonight, really, to dis you know, discuss these issues of, of Churchill and race. I mean, I think that kind of one important thing which has come out from the discussion that we've had, and I've been absolutely fascinated by uh, all the contributions um, that people have made, um, is that really, you know, we, we, we sort of start off by talking about Churchill, but really we're talking about attitudes to history in general, and actually, you know, one thing that we need to know more about is how, not just how ordinary people view particular figures, but how they uh, really regard the purpose of history and the nature of history. And then it becomes, um, you know, perhaps easier to understand you know, whether or not what one is doing is counterproductive. I mean, I take your point, you've sort of pressed a number of times that one might um, sort of you know, accidentally uh, sort of exacerbate the culture war by making certain points. And I certainly accept that there are ways uh, in which one can, you know, try and talk in a, in a way to sort of try and persuade people more. But ultimately, I think that uh, there are some people who won't be persuaded and that however, um, you know, sort of tactfully you try and put the point, um, will, uh, you know, ultimately revert back to their, you know, very nationalist view. And so, um, although uh, I think one obviously needs to sort of enter this uh, conversation uh, with an awareness of the kinds of reactions that you're likely to get and be prepared for those reactions. Um, I think that sort of trying to uh, you know, avoid offence in the in the interests of avoiding stoking up the culture war is probably something that's doomed to failure. Well, Richard, thank you. Um, I'm just going to invite um, Nima Omeo was one of our student ambassadors at Tortoise and has just joined us. And I was struck by your point about citizenship, Nima. So before coming to Richard, uh, to uh, Chris, sorry, I'm just going to ask you so what do you mean by that um so i basically the point i was making was that we often in these conversations forget to kind of look at the deeper issues that are underlying the conversations that we're having and we kind of have back and forth that for the most part the other side isn't really making those points anyway and with a lot of the conversation that's already been happening about um in the chat about Britishness and um, the legacy of empire. I think that that can't be separated from like citizenship and what we understand as being British and the ideas that like um, ultimately when like when the colonial, when, when empire was happening, um, it was at the same time the idea is, ideas of nationhood and what is British and what isn't British and who we are in relation to who others are were being created at the same time and we have never actually unpacked any of that. We've never really in any way looked at how that has that continues to manifest in our um, policies, in our, immigra uh, our understandings of immigration and so until we kind of have a real honest discussion about what that means to what it means to be British and I think a lot of people don't want to talk about the fact that like Britishness specifically Englishness often means whiteness and that and if we don't unpack what that means in our society today I don't think we're ever going to really have an honest conversation about Winston Churchill's legacy and what he means in a society that is ultimately steeped still in the legacies of empire and white supremacy. Uh, Nimo, thank you. 
Chris, uh, I know we're running out of time here, but I really do want to pick up on that final point from Nimo and hear what you think. You said we're a very divided country. It feels to me as though what we're really talking about here is having an agreed understanding of who we are as a country. And I wonder whether you think that that's getting more or less likely. I think it's impossible at this stage. Um, you know, Brexit and coronavirus, ironically, I mean, two different issues slam up at the same time, uh, lead to a very, very divided country. Um, not uh, even without all the other um, questions about identity. Um, but you asked, the earlier question you asked was, you know, how should we be re-evaluating or, or what should schools in a sense be saying about Churchill? I think the most important thing is nobody's perfect. Um, of course, it was good to defeat Hitler. And we've got to remember that lots of people now um, have very odd ideas about why we fought the Second World War. Um, lots of youngsters have no memory of the ho have no idea of what the Holocaust was about, um, and um, lots of people have no idea how anti-Semitic British society was in the 1930s. Um, mm. But I think we also have to teach people that appeasement doesn't work, um, and um, there were moments in which you needed a Churchill. I mean, there's Dunkirk is one of the classic instances. He's just become prime minister. And he has to ring the uh, British um, commanding officer in the, Cal in the garrison in Calais. And one of the things that's very rarely commented on is that, that he was the brother of a fellow MP. Um, and, and Churchill had to say to him, um, you have to stay. You cannot yes. go. And I know that that will be the ultimate sacrifice. I mean, you needed somebody who was able to do that in that moment. But he was also, you know, he was flawed. The Norway campaign, Tonopandi and so on. My, my problem with Churchill in the end is it's created this era of Britain believing in its own exceptionalism, that yeah. there's no other country ever in the history of um, humanity that has ever been as great as us. Uh, I think we should learn to distrust politicians who think they are Churchill, <laughs> in, particular, in particular ones who've written about Churchill with in, written books <laughs> full, stuffed full of mistakes. And then the final thing is, I don't think we should always believe that history is, a, is, a, is progress. Um, I, I'm sorry to refer to the gay thing again, but I'm always struck that the most liberal place in the world um, in, the 90, in the 20th century was Berlin for gay men in the 19, in late 1920s and 1930s. And within nine years, people were being carted off to concentration camps and killed. Mm -hmm. So the progress you win today is not necessarily and the progress you keep forever. Chris, thank you. Um, thank you everyone, in fact. Um, I worried, to be honest, about tonight's thinking because it's such a, either such a narrow topic that's a proxy for a big one, the UK and its history, or such a big one that we couldn't begin to articulate. But, you know, to mark us on our own homework, I think we really did. I'll say one personal thing rather than try to summarize what other people say is that um, I spent today writing uh, a piece trying to make sense of what uh, Harry Evans, uh, Harold Evans, meant to me. I've been a journalist my whole life and Harry was uh, a hero to me. And I really do understand the yearning that we have for heroes. And I think you can understand that they are flawed, that nobody's perfect. Um, but you do want to believe in an individual's capacity for goodness, for idealism, for, for determination. I think that my reading of this conversation and the where I come away from it on is to say, uh, no, we shouldn't uh, be ashamed of uh, Winston Churchill. That's, a, that's an excessive word, but we certainly should understand him uh, and his history much better. And having this debate is essential to doing exactly that. Um, so we're certainly not going to be ashamed of holding this uh, discussion, but I do think it leaves us in the, sp in the spot that I suppose between the two of uh, you, Nemo and Chris, come uh, point us to at the end, which is we are talking about some very profound divisions about citizenship, culture and identity that are a long way from being resolved, and there's no, uh, there's no ducking that. So on that note, thank you. A big thank you to you, Richard uh, Toy. Um, 
uh, given what's happening uh, in our understanding of history, I know there are huge demands on your time. Uh, and a huge thank you to you, Chris Bryant. Uh, it's really been fascinating hearing from both of you and from everyone this evening. Um, uh, I hope that uh, it's been useful and uh, worthwhile. Um, we're going to leave the conversation. Some people may want to compare notes in the chat. My colleague Liz Mosley will uh, continue to corral that. But for this evening, uh, please join me in, if not applauding, uh, Richard and uh, Chris and everyone who contributed, at least giving them a, a happy wave off. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.